nonprofit organization founded by older adults to connect, support, and inspire one another as we age. It's not a building or place. We're a virtual organization that offers a, a variety of support as services to assist our members in times of need and a calendar of hopefully stimulating activities to engage our members' minds. Mm -hmm. Our goal is to assist our seniors to live in place as, in, as where they call home for as long as they can. With that said, I would like to welcome and introduce our fairly newly elected mayor, Steve Young. Uh, Steve actually um, uh, went to UC Berkeley, graduated from there with his undergraduate degree and went on to obtain his master's from San Francisco State in policy and administration. He spent 28 years in local government and in 1999 became the director of community development for the city of Sacramento housing and development. Oh. In 2008, he retired and most interestingly, moved to, to Costa Rica with his family to be immersed in the language and to learn about a different culture. When he returned in 2013, he came to Benicia and settled here, and we're so glad he did. He was elected to the city council in 2016, and then recently elected to mayor in 2020. If I missed anything, Steve, you can fill in the blanks, and we're so pleased to hear from you and to hear what the plans are upcoming for our city. Well, thank you, Linda. Um, I think you covered most of the highlights. Um, uh, I guess the one thing you left out is uh, when we came back from Costa Rica, and when we moved to Costa Rica, it was at my, my wife's urging, and she wanted to uh, give our daughter an opportunity to grow up in a different culture. Mm -hmm. and get exposed to you know a, a different uh, kind of life and so she's uh my daughter spent her high school years in costa rica and um when she graduated uh from high school and came back here to go to school uh we realized at that time we would probably need to reconsider our uh, initial decision to live out our life in costa rica we had spent four years there at that time and, um, <laughs> My parents were aging at Rossmore. My brother was doing most of the caretaking, and I sort of felt like it was my, my turn to take on some of that responsibility. So coming back to Benicia was um, sort of a uh, connected to that uh, responsibility. And then when we got here in 2012, um, I didn't know a soul. I didn't know a single person in Benicia. Um, so I applied for uh, appointment to a variety of, I have, must have applied for five or six different city boards and commissions and um, ended up being appointed to the planning commission. So from 2012 to 2016, I was on the planning commission and that was the period of time when the crude by rail project was uh, in front of the planning commission. So um, I spent a lot of, a lot of time learning about that and talking about that and um, was sort of Okay. leading the planning commission uh, ultimate rejection of that project. And um, people who liked me and people who didn't like me, which is always the case. Um, but it uh, did propel me to, uh, when my term was up in 2016, to run for city council. And, um, so I was uh, fortunate enough to be elected. And then, you know, as Linda talked about, spent four years then and then ran again in 2020 uh, for mayor. And uh, if you were around and paying attention, you realize that that was a very um, contentious uh, election uh, and that uh, left some, uh, some scars, I think, to, uh, to try to heal. And so I've been talking, um, the, what made it contentious was uh, Valero decided that uh, I should not be elected and they spent $300,000 to uh, support my opponent, uh, Christina Strawbridge. And um, it got kind of nasty, but you know, my, my take on it was that they were so, the, the negative ads actually worked in my favor. And that there was a lot of people who were sort of, you know, ticked off at the tone. And so there was probably some sympathy votes that I got uh, because of that. But uh, I would hope that most people voted for me because they thought that I was, you know, the better candidate. But anyway, um, let me move on from that. I'll, I'll circle back to Valero a little bit later. I know that 
there were a couple things that uh, I wanted to speak of. One was, um, I guess, what's on everybody's mind is the, the COVID pandemic. Has everybody got their vaccinations? Um, is, if anybody is still needing a vaccination, um, the county now has done uh, brought it down to 65 and over. So um, anybody who's in that category should have signed up already and been going, but they're just continuing to do vaccination clinics. There's another one again this weekend. Um, so if you haven't, or you don't, if you know somebody who hasn't, please refer them to the uh, county public health website. And it's pretty easy to sign up. And uh, vaccinations have, have been pretty well run. Uh, we did one here, you may be aware of, was back in early February, the county uh, gave us, um, at that time it was 75 and over. Uh, so the, the city said, we can, we can vaccinate 75 and over, no problem. And so they gave us uh, about 1,400 for 14 to 1,500 doses. And uh, we, in about a four day period, got the word out, got everybody signed up and ran it on February 2nd and it went really well. Um, we did over 1,450 vaccinations that day. And uh, I think we proved to the county that we could do this so that if they make more vaccines available to us, we will do it again and we'll do it. And, and the, one of the latest things I've been working on is, it's a little bit out of, my, out of my lane, but the whole issue of opening schools again has been very contentious. And there's a proposed recall of two school board members that are, uh, sort of tied to the reopening question. And um, I have come out against that recall, but I have not gotten involved in decisions that the school district has to make about when they reopen and under what conditions. But I have said that vaccines uh, for teachers and staff is sort of a critical component of that. So I've been advocating with the county to uh, release vaccines to allow Venetia teachers to be vaccinated, which in turn should allow uh, schools to reopen. And um, the county has taken the position, we'll give you the vaccines if the school district says, we, this is a, a fixed date by which we will reopen and sort of commit to it. Uh, because otherwise they say, why should we give them, if you're, not, if you're not really going back, we'll put these in the arms of others who, who need it instead. So, I think it's getting close. We will actually perform the vaccinations. The city will um, once we get access to the vaccines. And that's, it's been a problem as anybody who reads the paper knows, um, vaccine availability has been the one thing that has held back uh, a lot of people from moving forward. So um, besides that, um, obviously the pandemic has had a real effect on the, on the community, uh, our retail, sales tax has been hit. Businesses, of course, have been really hit. Uh, some have closed. Uh, so the city has actually made some money available to help businesses uh, with water bills, uh, because we know that's a big deal. And now at the last meeting, we also expanded that to residents uh, who have been affected by the pandemic. So that would basically mean anybody who'd been laid off or furloughed or had their hours reduced um, would be eligible for uh, grants through the Family Resource Center uh, to help with water bills. And uh, we're fortunate that we had the money available to set this up. And I expect that will be you know, heavily used. Um, another topic that Susan suggested I uh, had been raised before as, was the question of affordable housing and senior housing. So uh, on that front, there is, there's a little bit of movement, but there's about to be a lot more. And that's because the state has uh, declared, rightly in my opinion, that we've got a real uh, crisis that are, is tied to homelessness, but it's really a lack of uh, housing. And that the, Venetia has been, very slow to be kind in building housing. And that's been a sort of, uh, you know, there's a, our, in fact, our general plan says part of it is to maintain small town character. And so um, for whatever reason, 
but partly because of zoning for single family uh, houses, we have not built any housing. We've, the housing we've built has been less than, less than 10 per year. And the state now has said, cities like Benicia who have not been building housing, it's time for you to step up. And uh, there is something called the Regional Housing Needs Assessment, which is um, something that sort of allocates responsibility for not necessarily constructing housing, but to show that you've got enough land that housing can be built on, uh, which turns into a zoning question. And their expectation for the city is gonna be in the range of about seven to 800 units, which is a big, big number for Benicia, uh, considering we've been building five a year. And now they want us to do seven or 800. And, um, and, and most of those are going to be uh, affordable housing. Oh, I'd like to do some senior housing. And um, one of the issues I think that is happening in town is the uh, fact that a lot of uh, seniors may be in houses that are too big for them. And they would like to move into something that may be one story. And because uh, a lot of our houses, at least downtown, are, are multi-story. And as we get older, um, those become less and less attractive. So um, can we build some senior housing that is one level, uh, maybe rental, maybe allow seniors to cash out their equity that they have in their houses, sell to families who would love to come to Benicia, but there's really no inventory of houses for sale here. Uh, so that has, what I'd like to see is um, some kind of senior housing built that would have preferences to Benicia residents. Um, it's a little tricky when you say, you know, I'm going to reserve this kind of stuff just for Benicia residents, uh, because depending on where your financing is coming from, and if it's government financing, you can't, you know, that could be considered discriminatory. So that's something that we have to sort of finesse. Um, and then, but the, then the big question is, well, where would you put 700 houses or, you, or rentals? Uh, and the obvious answer is the casino property. That's the last big undeveloped piece we have. Right now that's zoned industrial. Uh, the casinos would like to build single family subdivisions. I don't think that's necessarily what we want. Um, but it's, I think it's inevitable that it's going to be developed at some point. And that the, if that's the case, if you accept that, then the city ought to be the one who is sort of driving the bus and, and determining what goes on out there rather than uh, the landowners, per, perhaps. Because the casinos, if you know them, they, are just, they just do single family subdivisions. And that's all they want to do. And I think we need something that's more diverse and includes some retail. Uh, and that sort of leads into the other big looming question, which is water. How are you going to provide water for, you know, another few thousand people out there or another 500 units? Uh, because I'm convinced that our, the climate crisis is real and getting worse and that droughts are going to continue and, and become more frequent. And uh, providing water for the community is going to be a challenge. And particularly if we're talking now about, you know, 500 acres that we would allow, allow development on, then you're going to need even, even more water. Um, and then tied to that, we have an agreement with Valero that we provide them with what's called raw water, which is untreated water. Uh, but they use it for, um, in their refining process. They use it for steam, to generate steam, and uh, for cooling of the big towers that they have out there. And they actually take 60% of all the water that, Valero, that Benicia uses goes to Valero. And they have a contract that we pay them, or they pay us, I'm sorry. They pay us a million dollars a year for 60% of the water that's used. The rest of the community uses 40% and probably pays, well, you know what you pay, but collectively it's more on the term of maybe 10 to $12 million. So there is a, you know, inequity sort of built in uh, to that. So all of this sort of gets back to the question, where are you gonna get the water? And um, if in fact climate change gets worse, it's gonna become more of an issue. 
So one of the que- one of the projects that's being kicked around that I am in support of is what's called a water reuse project, and that is uh, would actually take. Right now, our wastewater is cleaned. They remove the solids. The solids are trucked somewhere, and then the rest of it is dumped in the streets. Uh, and we have to pay a, 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 a not a fine, but like a permit fee to. Uh, the, the big conservation and development commission in order to dump into the straits. So the idea is that um, rather than dumping into the straits, we would take that uh, liquid part, uh, which has then been treated at the treatment plant, the wastewater treatment plant, pump it up the hill to Lake Herman, put it in with the millions and millions of gallons in Lake Herman, mix it all up, and then send that water to their water treatment plant where it would be treated again. And by the time it goes through all this stuff, it would be drinkable. And, you know, everybody it would, it, it sounds bad. It's going to be a PR problem to try to convince people that this is actually okay. But this is do- being done in lots of other places. And if we could do that, if we could uh, make that happen, because we do about 20 million gallons a day, if we could make this happen, and that's expensive. It would cost, you know, $30 million probably to uh, make this happen. But I think there are some grants out there. And I'm talking to Valero about, you know, would you participate in this? Because they need the water as well as we do. Um, we could virtually become self-sufficient when it comes to water and not have to worry about any uh, of these issues going forward, uh, which would allow for more development, which would uh, more development translates into more not sales tax, which translates into <laughs> To, you know, better services for the community, um, but there will be it will be controversial for sure, because there's you know a lot of people, maybe the majority of people, who think that we love Venetia the way it is. Don't change it. Don't change anything, <clears throat> and that's going to be a a challenge because if we don't do something, if we sort of defy the state, um, the state can and has threatened to take away uh, transportation money. So we rely on the state and uh, some of the bridge toll money and some of the other things that are under state control for road maintenance. And our roads are bad. Everybody knows they're bad. Um, And it's one of these things where nobody wants taxes raised. Nobody wants to pay more in fees. All the costs keep going up all the time. And so eventually, you know, something's got to give. And uh, that's this, this whole question of uh, housing is going to be very controversial, I'm afraid. And that will be tied to the water thing, which might also be very controversial. So there's lots of uh, challenges ahead. Um, but uh, I, think, I think we're up to it. I think um, the other thing that's happened that was um, important, I believe, it was hiring uh, Eric Upson as our city manager. Um, Eric was brought in when um, Lori Tinfo resigned. And um, at the time, I thought, you know, I liked Eric a lot. He's done great things for the police department. We've got a great police department. And I thought he would sort of, you know, be the right person to, you know, help us in, so on an interim basis. But he just, you know, so we appointed him as the interim city manager. And with the intent of going out and recruiting through the regular process and finding some experienced city manager from somewhere else and hiring somebody. And he got in there and I got to tell you, he just went to work and did, you know, just jumped into it. He had ideas on how to change things. He just started doing stuff um, that was very um, assertive. And uh, I was very impressed by what he did. I think the whole council was so we decided to uh, just appoint him without going through a recruitment process. And we've had a little bit of pushback from people saying, well, you know, why would you hire somebody who's never been a city manager, who's been a police chief? And um, I think actually that may turn out to be a benefit because when um, people who come up through the city manager ranks, and I've been in city government my whole career, they you know, they, they sort of have been trained in a certain way and there's a certain built-in response to issues um, that is all sort of treated in similar fashions. 
And Eric, because he did not have that background, he just approaches it from a totally different perspective. And uh, one example I'll give you is uh, I, I read about a program that the city of Concord was doing uh, back in the, in the fall um, that was one where they would uh, provide a, <clears throat> a 50% bonus. Uh, this was through their Chamber of Commerce. The Chamber of Commerce was selling gift cards for Concord businesses. And the city said, oh, if you buy one of these gift cards, we'll match, we'll put 50% on top of it. And I read that and I went, wow, that's simple. It's easy. You know, maybe we ought to try something like this. So I sent it to Eric with a note that says, well, can we get this on an agenda quickly because Christmas season is coming up and let's try to get this going. And uh, when I talked about it later, he says, uh, I said, when can we get it on the agenda? He says, no, I just did it. I just went ahead and, 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 and instituted it. And I went, wow, that's, you know, the kind of, uh, I don't know what the right word is, initiative, where, you know, it's like, if it's a good idea, I'm not going to waste time and weeks going through a bureaucratic process when there's a uh, sensitive time commitment. So that's, uh, that's one of the reasons I like Eric a lot, and I think he's going to be successful. So maybe I ought to stop there because I see it's 1050 and I've been talking for 20 minutes. Um, you wanted to open it up for a particular questions, Susan? How do you want to handle this? Uh, so um, I'm gonna, we've been recording just so you know that we, you'll be able to go back because I know the mayor covered a lot of really interesting information. Um, so I have muted people, people so we wouldn't have as much um, side noise. So I think that probably the best thing to do is raise your hand if you have a, a question or something you want to say and then unmute yourself. I'll call on you and then you can unmute yourself. So anyone have the first question? Uh, Linda Barron. Um, Steve, uh, what are we currently doing about the homeless that are in Benicia? I think uh, Eric Upson said at the time he spoke to us that there were, um, uh, that there were 44 homeless in Benicia of various things. I know I've got one on K Street who wanders up and down with his wagon full of stuff. Uh, is there is there any place or any way to house these folks or? Well, um, it's it's obviously a complicated uh, issue. Yeah. Um, what we do, we don't have a shelter in Benicia, um, but we have on occasion uh, put people in motel rooms. Um, most of the shelters are in Fairfield. And uh, so we also offer people uh we have one or two beds set aside for Benicia residents in these shelters in Benicia uh, that we offer to take people up there. But many people don't want to go, including the guy on K Street. Right. He has, uh, there, there's what's called service resistant. And it's not that, and he's actually got money. So it's not like he can't go somewhere. He just chooses to live this way. And um, the, there has been a court ruling out of, Boise, Idaho, that uh, affects the Ninth Circuit, which we are part of. And it basically says, unless there is a place that a homeless person can go and be sheltered, it's not legal for cities to outlaw camping or sitting on a sidewalk or on a bench or on, you know, loitering. You can't enforce loitering ordinances, um, which is sort of what people have, did in the past. So we're not really able to, uh, you know, not that I would support it anyway, but we have running them out of town or just sort of arresting them or homelessness is not a crime. Uh, these people that have, you know, unless they have mental issues uh, where they're a threat to themselves or others, then you can pick them up on a 5150, it's called. Um, but uh, short of that, if they are resistant to going into a, a program, uh, or a, uh, and, and part of the problem is that we, if you're going to, people, for example, says, well, let's do some tiny homes or let's do some of these, just something to get them out of the weather, um, which would certainly be humane. Uh, you, if you're going to do that, you really have to have some kind of services as well. You can just, you know, put them out somewhere. A, where are you going to put them? Where is that spot that this would happen? 
Uh, no neighborhood would like it if it was put in their neighborhood. If it was out on the edge of town in some remote area, um, that may not have any neighborhood problems, but they also don't have any services. It's, and you can't really just sort of try to isolate people. Um, so really the answer is housing and uh, housing with services. So for example, there are people who live in RVs up on the overlook off of 680, uh, up at the end of Lake Herman Road. And um, it's not the city property. It's actually not in the city at all. It's part of the county. So CHP is the jurisdiction that uh, is responsible for it. And normally there is a uh, requirement that if you're in an RV, you have to move it every 72 hours. And that's true in, in Benicia. If you get, you're parking on the street, you got to move it every 72 hours. Up there, the CHP has sort of taken a more lenient position and said, you know, look, we realize these are people who are living here because they got nowhere else to go. And um, so they have not enforced that. And there is, in fact, I, I believe there's somebody on this uh, Zoom right here, uh, Pat, had uh, I talked to about um, other kinds of support that could be, <coughs> excuse me, provided to these kind of people, not these kind of people, sorry. Uh, to homeless uh, individuals and families. So it's, uh, we, we have a dedicated police officer. That, that's the other thing is that um, because we don't have mental health people, we don't have homeless coordinators, we don't really have social services in Benicia. That's one of the reasons that people are diverted to Fairfield where those things do exist. Um, and if we had uh, people who are able to mental health counselors, for example, you know, then we would be able to provide better services. We have one dedicated police officer who is sort of our homeless uh, connection person, but um, it's, I don't know if that's a satisfactory answer, but that's sort of, you know, where we're at. Yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate it. It is a very complicated issue that every city has to address, and I appreciate mm -hmm. your thoughts on it. All right, so we had uh, two people raise their hands in the chat. Uh, uh, Kathy Carriage, and then it'll be uh, Jean Walker. So Kathy, if you want to unmute yourself. Kathy, can you unmute yourself? <laughs> All right, I guess we'll go uh, to Jean Walker. Jean, can you uh, unmute yourself? And then I see your hand, Alan. Okay. Um Hi, Steve. This is Jean. Uh, so regarding that um, decision by the Ninth in Idaho, was it Idaho by the Ninth yes. Circuit? Yes. Um, I'm aware, well, does that apply to individuals who sleep overnight in their cars near parks that have bathrooms available? Well, I'm not... It's and maybe often, you don't know the answer to that. Well, people are, like I said, they're allowed to be in their cars for 72 hours without moving it. Um, I'm talking about within the city. Yeah. And that, that, that's the rule in the city as well, whether it's occupied or unoccupied. Just a, a parked car cannot stay on the street without moving for more than 72 hours, whether there's people in it or not. Um, so if they're near the park and they got access to bathrooms, that's actually a better situation than if they were just on their own without, without access to bathrooms. Um, so this is sort of the, you know, it's not ideal certainly, but it's, uh, it's certainly allowable. Okay, so I can't specify the type of situation this is, but there is something, there is a, an individual who is in that situation and is being told to move at night because the park is in a neighborhood, a residential area, and the residents complain, and the police won't allow this individual to remain overnight. And um, I can't go into the details because it might identify who this person is, but um, it doesn't seem like the police are following what the Ninth Circuit has has right. laid down. Uh, and from your description, I would agree with you. And so I would just say that 
if you want to contact me offline, um, send me some information. I'll uh, pass it on to the, the new police chief, Mike Green, and um, raise this okay. issue. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Sure. All right. It looks like Kathy, you uh, were able to unmute yourself. So go ahead, Kathy Carriage. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm unmuted or not. We can you hear, are, you. hear you, Kathy. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> uh, well, my question is, uh, you know, we do have people who are living on the street and, you know, I'm thinking particularly of the guy on West K, but can the city partner in any way with churches just so that on rainy, cold nights, they can provide some shelter for those people? Because um, I'm sure he's probably not the only one. He's just sort of the most visible one. Well, certainly. Uh, there, there was nothing that would stop churches from opening it up or the city from supporting that uh, move, whether it was money or uh, other types of resources. And that would certainly be a preferable uh, situation uh, as compared to just, you know, living under a bush somewhere and coming out during the day. And um, so I guess the short answer is certainly we could, we could do that. All right. And I think uh, Alan is next. Just unmuted myself. Uh, changing subjects a little. Pedestrians and on downtown. We live in a very pedestrian, popular and used community. And downtown has a lot of movement. A lot of the drivers don't understand that when a pedestrian enters the, the crosswalk, they ought to stop. Uh, uh, half of them have cell phones in their hand and aren't looking. So you definitely have to stop. Is there any way we can do a pedestrian study and make the crosswalks a little bit more, more uh, pronounced? And the other thing is uh, potentially uh, have some warnings to the drivers. You know, that big sign that used to hang across, you know, about pedestrians and crosswalks. Watch for pedestrians and crosswalks. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, there's no reason we can't do kind of that. that. Um, there are uh, what the city can do in, in terms of traffic um, is somewhat constrained by state law. Uh, for example, one of the things we get a lot of complaints about is speeding cars in residential neighborhoods. And uh, the obvious answer is, well, why can't you just put a stop sign at that, at that intersection? Uh, believe it or not, you can't just do that and you can't use stop signs for speed control. You've got to go through a whole study and you got to show that people are speeding and that um, you've exhausted sort of other remedies. The, the answer to the pedestrian thing, you know, it would be nice to have those sort of lighted sidewalks that we have on military yeah. in one second and have sure. those available. Um, that's sort of more a question of money more than anything else. It does, you know, it's, it's not cheap to put those things in, um, but certainly repainting the crosswalks or uh, making them more visible in some way would uh, certainly be helpful. We don't have a lot of police officers who are out doing traffic enforcement. We've actually only got two in the entire force who do traffic enforcement. And they are usually sitting in these neighborhoods where people are complaining about speeding cars and they're trying to ticket speeding cars. Uh, putting them downtown to try to tag people who are uh, not stopping at crosswalks uh, can certainly be done. Uh, it would have to be a direction, I think, from the, the yeah. chief uh, to do that. Uh, because, you know, we don't, even, we don't even have parking tickets, as you know. There's no restrictions on where you can park, how long you can park. So that's been a, a, another problem uh, with downtown, I think, is that you know, we have uh, limited parking and a lot of it's taken up by, or at least it, before the pandemic, it was taken up by employer, employees who wanted to park close. And so it made it hard for uh, tourists and visitors to find a place nearby. But uh, the visibility issue is a real uh, problem. In fact, the, uh, the one intersection that has been really problematic is on Military West and West 5th where there is not a, a sign or a light or anything. And it's sort of at the top of a hill and starts to head down towards uh, 7th. There's visibility problems there where, and, and, and a pedestrian has been hit there. So that's sort of a focus right now is to try to get that intersection addressed. Um, 
I haven't heard so much about. Uh, and then we had somebody uh, hit and killed on uh, East Fifth. So we, we are aware that, you know, pedestrian safety has, is an issue. But, you know, the best way to approach it is probably these lighted sidewalks. And so it's a question of are we going to re, uh, recommit or reallocate monies from street repairs, for example, in order to do uh, lighted sidewalks? And maybe we should. Uh, the one thing I would uh, commend to everybody is that a week from Saturday on the 27th, the council is going to be having an all day goal setting and priority setting workshop. And so we're going to be hearing from department heads on some of these issues that I've been talking about. Uh, and then the council will be talking about where do we see, what kind of direction do we want to give the staff? So there will be opportunity for the public to participate. And that may be the time to uh, maybe put a phone call in during the meeting when we're all there and see if that, you know, generates enough uh, interest and support to, uh, put it on our priority list and give direction to staff to, to do that. Okay, thanks. Uh, I'll try and get a letter in, it would probably be better. Well, actually letters, um, we get a lot of letters. Okay. And uh, having the, having a call, somebody calling in during the meeting is actually in my opinion, okay. more, more effective. Okay. And the other, one other intersection that's occasionally a problem is if you're crossing first street towards Safeway and you're on the east side of the intersection towards the library. Mm -hmm. When the green when the walk sign goes on, so does the green light arrow go on. And oh. the people want to make the turn the same time you want to enter the, the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. And you, you've resolved it over by Second Street by having that big red thing, which I'm sure is very expensive. Right. But um when I walk to Safeway, I cross the street before at a stop sign and then go across the west side of the intersection as safety. But it's just that, that one spot is a problem. Yes. Thank you. Right. Okay. No problem. Thank you. Helen. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, hi, Steve. Um, I just wanted to give a shout out for um, also, um, I had a biking accident um, last week at. Um, 10th and K, um, a, a motorist who didn't stop at uh, the stop sign. Um, and also, I believe another member, um, Loa, uh, was also knocked down there at that same intersection on 10th and K. So I just wanted to give a shout out for that to be looked into. And is that one where there is a new stop sign up, uh, already? It's a four way stop sign. That's all I know. Yes. Because we put in a couple of stop signs at intersections on K Street um, at the request, uh, because we did the studies and showed that there mm -hmm. were accidents, um, which justified putting in the stop signs. Um, and so that was good for the neighbors, a lot of the commuters or people who use K because there weren't stop signs. Um, they didn't like it so much. But there's, I guess, always trade-offs when you make these kinds of decisions some people are going to like it and some some people are make you know are not because it's le less convenient to get okay. downtown if you have to stop a few times i'm not sympathetic to that because i use that route as well but yeah uh, mm -hmm. all right okay thank you so uh, we have a uh, time for a couple more questions i had lois go ahead and unmute yourself hi steve and hi, lois. everybody hi uh there's a couple things that have kind of been on Cartinius Village's radar for a while that have been kind of in the background, but I wanted to mention, we were starting to work with Elizabeth last spring on making Benicia an age-friendly city, but about the time we started meeting with her was when uh, the COVID came along, and so that kind of went to the background. Uh, so I just want to sort of say that we would like to get back into that at some point, <laughs> When it, it's not the biggest issue, but it's it's there, and it would be it would benefit the community in the long run. And along with that, uh, we have been uh, talking about a senior roundtable or some some kind of a forum where seniors could talk to the city about their needs or problems or that sort of thing. And so uh, we actually have worked with uh, someone in the rec park and rec department and uh, we are going to have a zoom 
round table for, and we've invited other organizations in town who might be interested. We're gonna start that in, uh, we're gonna have one of those in early March. And um, so I just wanted you to know, I came to that planning meeting you had a couple of years ago and pitched these things, but they didn't go any place. So I just kind of want to say that both of those things are on our radar and, and uh, would, would like them to be on your radar as well. Okay. Well, I would need to learn a little bit more about it. I'm not exactly uh, sure what age, age friendly uh, implies or uh, what the implications to the uh, city would be. Uh, yeah. for, of doing that, but you know, it certainly sounds good. Uh, yeah. So uh, yeah. Yeah. I just encourage you to continue pushing it, and you know, okay. with, with all with all things, it's you know, it's easy to say squeaky wheels get greased, and there's a certain truth to that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you need to keep pushing for your issue, and okay, uh, getting to as many of the council people as you can. Uh, or, okay. or calling in next on the 27th and making a pitch yeah. again. Um, okay. Thank you. Sure. All right. Other, other questions? Comments? Uh, John, go ahead and, and unmute yourself. Hi, right, thank you. Hey, Steve, what's uh, uh, what's this the general state of our financial situation? I know obviously COVID is affecting everybody, but I haven't seen anything in the newspaper or online. But just what's your just general seat of the pants uh, feeling on where we're at just overall in the city? I would say we're actually doing better than expected. Um, we uh, anticipated a bigger hit. Uh, property taxes have actually been up because uh, sales price, because very few houses are selling and those that are selling are selling quickly and for a lot more money than anticipated. So we're actually doing better on that. Sales tax and hotel tax were certainly uh, taking a hit. But the good news is we had some money left over uh, from previous years uh, due to the very salary savings and projects that didn't uh, get going. So we've been sort of coasting on this, um, re some reserves uh, that we've had. And so I'm confident that we can get through this pandemic, assuming we can get through it in the next year, that we will be back to a uh, relatively uh, good situation. Now that doesn't mean we have enough money to do everything that people want. It doesn't mean we have enough money to fix all our streets. Um, that's a real challenge. Our streets are not in good shape and um, it's the estimate is $60 million it's gonna to take to bring them up to just an average state. And um, that gets into discussions about, you know, should you look at the very worst streets uh, first and rebuild them, which is very expensive, or do you sort of focus on streets that are not quite so bad and you wanna keep them in at least passable condition so you don't have to rebuild them? And so it's sort of a balancing act on what you do with your money. Um, and this and the city public works has sort of a scientific algorithm they use to sort of make these recommendations. But of course, people want their street done now. Uh, and so there's you know frustration uh, for doing that. So we're a long way from having enough money to do all the streets we need to do. We're a long way from having enough money to do the capital improvements we need to do for the water and wastewater system. You know, our city's old and we have pipes that break all the time. And we have, you know, people certainly complain about the water rates. And I understand that um, they're certainly higher than they were five years ago. Uh, but that's partly the because the councils for 10 or 20 years before that refused to raise rates uh, because they knew that People weren't going to like it. And when they didn't raise the rates, we didn't have enough money to do the, the basic maintenance that we need to do. And uh, we're in a situation where we, it's pay as you go. You don't, we don't have <clears throat> money set aside to do the kinds of improvements and that we need to do. So it's like, okay, we're going to raise the rates and part of it will go towards running the system. And part of it will be set aside to make some improvements to replace hundred year old uh, sewer lines. Um, but then one of those hundred year old sewer lines breaks in the middle of the night 
And that money that's been set aside for some improvement down the road has to be spent to fix the sewer line. So uh, it's, believe it or not, we're gonna have to go through another rate study and consider even uh, potential more rate increases for water. And it's gonna be, people are gonna you know, freak out and be upset. And I understand that, um, but our, our alternatives are sort of bleak. Um, and you know, we should probably never have set up our own water and sewer system um, when it was done. We were a small town then, we're a small town now. This is a very complicated, technologically uh, driven, expensive to run kind of operation. Lots of permits required, lots of training for the staff required, lots of certifications. Um, and so uh, to run an enterprise of this, it, that, it costs us about $40 million a year to run water and wastewater. And that's compared to our, our general fund which is about 47 million. So we spent almost as much on water and sewer as we do on everything else. Um, but, and, the, and we're just sort of limping by at that rate. So, you know, if, if we were to start over again, we probably wouldn't be doing it ourselves. We'd be part of a larger regional agency, you know, because, you know, there's economies of scale that kick in for East Bay mud or Contra Costa water or somebody like that. They can do it cheaper on a per household basis because they have a lot more customers. We're trying to run this operation with 9,000 customers. And when the costs keep going up like they are, but your number, your customer base doesn't increase, well, you, you do the math, you can figure out what happens to the rates if you're gonna to try to maintain this. And so, you know, the short answer is on the day-to-day -day stuff for the general fund, I think we're okay long-term for things like roads and water and wastewater and pensions, not so good. So um, that's why we're gonna have to, I think, have growth to increase our tax base, to allow us to do um, more things uh, going down the road. All right, any other questions? So um, we have a few more minutes. Maybe I can ask you to talk about something I know you were really involved with, and that's uh, food insecurity oh, sure. uh, in our county. So uh, when the uh, pandemic first hit, uh, it was clear to me, at least, that we may have real issues with people losing their jobs and then actually you know, being scrambling to cover basic uh, necessities, including food. And so um, I uh, put together a, uh, there were a number of churches, primarily churches, uh, who were uh, asked to join this group called Venetia Strong. It was, soon became Venetia Strong. And it was sort of focused on food uh, insecurity and provi providing food to the community. And uh, it included Northgate Church and St. Paul's and Heritage Presbyterian and Community Congregational um, and all of those churches on, in one way or another were providing some kind of service, uh, St. Dominic's as well. And um, we thought it would be better to sort of get everybody together and try to coordinate so that we're not duplicating and we're spreading the resources where we could. So that group uh, got formed, it's still together. It was added, uh, we soon were uh, joined by this woman, Heather Perini, who started a program called Food is Free. Uh, she was Food is Free Benicia. It started out as just sort of a pop-up stand in front of her house where she had, you know, like excess uh, fruits and uh, out of her backyard and then started asking for donations for others. And uh, for a while it was challenging because people like didn't like the idea that it was free and they thought it would be uh, exploited by people who didn't really need it. If, he, if it was free, then, you know, who's to say that somebody, maybe in this group or anyone else, you know, I could just go up and pick something. I don't need to, I don't need to have free food. I'll pay for it, but what, nothing was stopping me from taking it. Um, but we made a conscious decision that we're not going to be asking people to prove that they need food. If you need food, take the food. And so um, Heather, uh, actually uh, started expanding that program. She's an amazing person. 
Uh, she's went and started looking for government food programs. She ended up getting uh, some contracts with uh, the USDA, uh, family, farm, farm to family, it's called. And so she was getting boxes of produce being delivered. Uh, and to an extent where now she needed a much bigger place to store this stuff. So we helped her get a, a refrigerated trailer. She moved over to the fairgrounds. Uh, she's been doing distributions uh, at the fairground almost every weekend, boxes of food, uh, and then expanded to uh, Solano County. And so now there's a lot more being done in Vallejo and Fairfield and Vacaville. So uh, she's you know, turned this into a real uh, important thing for the community. So, uh, you know, that, that program, the church programs, uh, and the F uh, Family Resource Center, where we make grants to people for a variety of things, I think we've got a fairly good handle on, you know, St. Paul's, for example, serves almost 300 meals uh, twice a week uh, to anybody who shows up. Uh, that's significant. And, and that's being supported by local restaurants. I think Valero kicks some money in. Um, so there's a lots of different ways that the community is responding to the issue of food insecurity. Um, and hopefully we're going to get through this pandemic by the fall or the end of the year. And, um, you know, the vaccines are supposed to, the president says that by the end of July, he thinks everybody will be vaccinated. Um, that there will, he's ordered enough vaccines to make that happen. So if that happens, we could be back to normal by the end of the year. And that's something that uh, everybody is certainly hoping for. Uh, I'd like to do the Christmas tree parade next time. You know, this was, I think 4th of July is not gonna happen probably, but uh, you know, we, we'll focus on trying to get back to normal by the late fall or, or Christmas time. Um, okay. All right, so thank you very much. I, I wanna let you go a couple minutes early so you can get ready for your next meeting, but we really appreciated uh, your talk today and um, you've been such a good friend of the village uh, moving forward. I see lots of people clapping there. <laughs> um, and so thank you so much and hopefully you'll, you'll come and talk with us again. I will anytime. Um, I enjoy this kind of stuff and I think it's a good way to try to get information out to the community and to hear from people about you know what you feel are something that I ought to know about or be spending my time working on. So I want to thank uh, Carquinez Village for the opportunity to uh, speak with you. And I'm uh, certainly willing to do it again if you uh, run short of speakers. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Steve. All right. <laughs> thank you all.